What's up, everybody? Long time no do podcast. Um, chilling here at the house. Just finished watching the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Golden Knights. I got the Leafs hat, Golden Knights shirt, and my go- my hope was that it would go to overtime so that both teams would get a point. It did. It was one of the most exciting overtimes you'd ever see in hockey. If you're not a hockey fan, I suggest just watch an overtime or two, and you're gonna be like, you're gonna fall in love. It's so much fun. So. Um, so yeah, I haven't done a podcast in a while, but I have been listening to a few. One of them uh, that I listen to regularly is Remco Rinkema, hosts one for the Poker Central podcast. Uh, Poker Central podcast, right. And uh, he does one called Heads Up with Remco. They also do like newsy ones. And um, they had Brandon Adams on, which was a guest, told some really great stories. And I have my own little Brandon Adams golf story that I wanted to share with you, as well as uh, talk my, I just talk a little bit about sort of my journey to GTL. I've been studying pretty hard. I do what's called a PSP, something I learned when I did that course at Choice Center. PSP essentially stands for Personal Strategic Plan. Over a three month period, um, what I do is um, basically set a goal, you know, uh, in a couple areas of my life, and I set a roadmap for how I'm gonna achieve it in three months, then how I'm gonna do, what am I gonna have to do every month, benchmarks weekly, daily, the whole deal. So one of them was my goal is to gain a lot of weight, um, not just fat, I've gained a little fat, but you know, that's part of the deal when you're trying to bulk up. Um, goal is to get to 80 pounds of skeletal muscle mass based on, you know, the, you know, the reading there. Um, and I'm at, stuck at 77.6, started the workout at 72, but I'm very comfortable to get there. Just been a little bit plateauing. Uh, haven't been like pounding the protein, oh, professor. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but before I got to those stories and what else did I want to talk about? I obviously want to talk a little bit also about um, Chris Ferguson and you know Phil Hellmuth's you know picture tweet with him, and go over some of the reasons why um, I treat Howard Letter differently than I would someone like Chris Ferguson. So that's what you can expect. But before we get all that, um, I was talking to Remco about this, and I said maybe I do it on a show, but I thought you know what, let's just just do it here. Um, I have a story about, uh, and I'm really bad with dates, so I may screw up the dates a little bit here. But it starts, let's say, we're gonna start it all, it's, it's related to my love life, okay? And this one might be a long story, because this one's interesting. It's about a relationship that I had with a girl um, over about 11 month period. Uh, in 2011, probably from 2007 or eight, in that neighborhood to 2011, I was like head over heels in love with Amanda Leatherman. You remember her, the little one from the big game? Just um, always felt like I had good chemistry with her, and we got along really well, and it was just fun. She's crazy. And, um, you know, part of the, the whole, you know, wild, wild thing, you know, about her was probably what attracted me to her the most, but it was also what made it difficult to be in a relationship. So I would say sometime in July of 2011, um, I'd expected her to be with me the whole month during the world series and kind of hanging out. And she was like all over the place, not in my house. Um, and so I was kind of like, okay, I think this is, yeah, this isn't going to work or whatever, but, uh, it didn't, it felt like it was headed that way. So I'm sitting there playing and um, some Italian friends of mine introduced me to uh, a girl who comes up on the rail named Christina Polgar. If you don't know who Christina Polgar is, um, you'll find Google images of her. She was Miss Hungry, two, Miss Hungry Earth or Miss Hungry something, 2008 I wanna say. And really sweet girl. So that night, um, I was planning on meeting up with Amanda but she was out with friends or whatever. And I'm like, you know what, screw it. You know, we were not in a relationship so I decided to, you know, go out and have some drinks with Christina, and uh, you know, we hit it off. She's she was like really really fun and cool and chill, and she was just getting into poker and stuff like that. So, um, the Amanda thing fizzled. Like we didn't talk for a little bit, and uh, I started dating Christina. She lived in Hungary, so that made it a little bit difficult. But uh, you know, I spent some time over at her place in Hungary, and while I was traveling um, from tournament to tournament, we made a couple stops here and there. But ultimately just wasn't like an ideal match, I think, for either of us. Uh, And she's moved on to have two beautiful babies. That's gonna be a theme, by the way. (laughs) Because like, typically, when I break up with somebody, they move on and they they have babies and I'm very, very happy for them. Um, So moving forward then, uh, the Christina thing was over. Say about January 2012, okay, again, I'm bad with dates, but I think I'm right with this. January 2012, I'm on Twitter and some girl replies to one of my tweets and I do what I would always do when some girl just, you know, click on the picture. So I, I looked at the picture and I was like, she's cute, like really cute. So I sent her back a message. She sent me back a message on Twitter. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll follow her. I don't know her, but let's follow her. 
And then I noticed she was like back and forth with Russell Hans. You remember the guy from Survivor? Older dude. Um, so, you know, anyway, so we start like DMing, you know, and then that turns into phone calls. So we start chatting on the phone. You know, she's, uh, she's really cute, as I said, incredibly cute. She was at the time, oh, 2012. She was 22, I wanna say, right around 22 years old. She was a little on the young side, but I've always had a rule. You know, I've dated younger girls, but never if I'm like more than twice their age, because I think that's really just creepy and weird. So she fit the bill. I was like, you know, I wasn't quite twice her age. She was a little on the young side, even for me though, because like 22, you know, girls are just getting started out and you know, they don't really, they're just wait, it's just too young, right? So anyway, um, we start talking more and more, you know, about just life and stuff and, you know, really hitting it off. She's really, you know, funny and like seem, you know, relatively mature for her age too, for just a 22 year old girl. And um, then she tells me, cause I was like, you know, I was gonna like, you know, talk to her on FaceTime or like, you know, send pics and stuff. And she told me the story about her struggles. So she'd struggled with, and this is where it gets a little weird and complicated. She struggled with anorexia, which is common amongst a lot of young girls. She had like an eating disorder. But on top of that, she was part of this like website where a lot of young girls who also had this problem would share pictures of themselves on like of this, this anorexic website. And they would all like kind of share and stuff like that. It became sort of a twisted obsession or whatnot. So she's in therapy, obviously. She went to you know, get some help for that and stuff like that. And part of it was, you know, part of the um, stipulations were obviously she wasn't really supposed to even be on the internet. She certainly wasn't supposed to be sending pictures and all that kind of stuff because it could trigger um, a relapse into anorexia and she was doing quite well at the time. So it's an interesting story. You know, we talked on and off from January, you know, for a little while. And this, we, we, we would talk like two, three hours on the phone a lot, right? Um, and then finally I was like, okay, this has been, you know, a few months I've been talking to this girl. It's like, okay, this is kind of ridiculous, you know? I've never met her. You know, we've never conversed online. So I'm like, okay, why don't you come to Vegas? She's from Kentucky. And uh, we won't use her name because, you know, we'll just leave that part out. And I'll tell you why later. Um, so she's from Kentucky. And I was like, okay, well, why don't you come out to, uh, to Vegas and let's, like, have fun, you know, and meet up and, you know, see, we'll see what's there. So um, she sends me, she just sent me pictures occasionally, you know, of herself. She wasn't supposed to, but she would send some pics of, like, you know, some highs and different things and whatnot. Um, and so like when it was time for her to, you know, like I wasn't sure if she, she was gonna able, gonna able to make, she was still in school. She was in school there in Kentucky, but she was able to book a flight. She, you know, she sent me this cute pic of like, you know, her name on the flight, on the ticket. And it's like to Vegas, you know, I'm thinking sweet. So this is, you know, this is gonna happen, right? And so I'm all prepared. She's supposed to come on a Friday. That Thursday, okay, that Thursday, I get a call from her that her therapist says it's probably not a good idea yet for her to go because it's too soon based on you know her issues and things like that so it's like really this is strange um but you know then i just so then i was like well let me i said let me talk to your therapist because like i mean i'm not gonna you know i don't know i figured maybe i could like win over the therapist and change your mind so um so i end up having a call with her therapist for a solid 45 minutes talking about you know all of her issues and all you know and what she's going through and how, you know, she's very protective of um, her going on this trip and blah, blah, blah. Um, so make a long story short, she you know, doesn't deem that it's, she's ready enough to come to Vegas. So she doesn't come to Vegas. And, you know, we continue to talk on the phone. And um, one of the things that I noticed, you know, throughout that period too, was like, she was always online. So if she saw me, cause I mean, we're not a, we're not a couple, you know, I'm just like talking to this girl. and. Um, she would see pictures or videos of me like flirting with somebody and she'd get like super jealous. Like as soon as a picture got posted on Instagram or anything, not even me, she'd find it and was like, who's this girl? Where's this, you know, da da da. I'm like, whoa, it's a little creepy, you know? Um, but uh, I tried to like, just I put up with it for the most part. I was like, okay, it's kind of cute, but silly. And then I want to say, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to say around May of 2012, I do a show called, like, yeah, right around May, called The Millionaire Matchmaker, okay? I don't know if you've seen it. It was on Bravo, this Patty Stanger thing. You know, Patty Stanger, she's the one who's like, oh, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. And that show was kind of fun, but also a bit of a train wreck because the guy who I did the show with was like, he was out there. He, he made me look good, I'll tell you that much, because he was like, yeah, he was, uh, they called himself Richie Rich because he had like mama's money. 
he wasn't like self-made millionaire. He was just like literally like Richie Rich. Um, what did he named? He named his boat Morning Wood. <laughs> That's what he named his boat Morning Wood. And the best part of it was he named his boat Morning Wood on his date. He took the girl out on the boat and he couldn't get the boat started. <laughs> he couldn't get Morning Wood started. So she puked on the boat. That was funny. But anyway, me and Lindsay, you know, we really hit it off. We had a blast, man. We like, we tore up Vegas. We started in LA, we got a private plane, we had some champagne, we flew over to Vegas, we, you know, had a, you know, like a dinner, we went to a show, we did like all kinds. And then like, there was this thing at the end of the show where you're not allowed to like hang out with them after that. Cause they are like, they're, they have rights over you. So on video, she had to say like, I grant Daniel Grounding permission to like, you know, have me in custody or whatever you want to call it. Like permission to just hang out with her. So, cause I had way more plans for us. We ended up going to a club, me, just me and her. Got kicked out for grinding, which is really weird. <laughs> That's so weird. Okay, I can't believe I just shared that part, but it's true. So um, we played some blackjack, had some fun. And the timing for us meeting was a little bad for me because right at the end of May, you know, you should come out to Vegas, you know, to hang out a little bit. But then World Series of Poker comes, June, July, right? So June, July, I'm like really not available. She came, she went to EDC for a little bit, you know, um, you know, while I was, while she, she was trying to spend some time with me, I'm like, you know, during the World Series, I just, I don't have no time because I, I do the full grind thing. So, um, you know, that sort of put a fizzle into it. But all the while, you know, while I'm, you know, dating Lindsay, like I'm getting, you know, text messages and calls from little Miss Kentucky, right? And she's really upset. She's like, I don't know about this Lindsay girl and da 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 um, and all this kind of stuff. And I remember like, she was always pretty, she was kind of like funny judgmental because like there was one person on Twitter that followed me, some girl um, who also happened to be from Kentucky. And uh, she was a little older and like, you know, I don't know. So we would make fun of her, like kind of together. Like I made fun of her, silly, but privately, like not in front of her face or not like that. Um, but yeah, she, she, ha she, <laughs> she had some nicknames for Christina. She had nicknames for Lindsay. She had nicknames for all of them. Um, Anyway, so the World Series is over. Still, you know, somewhat talking to her occasionally here and there. We're keeping in touch a pretty good amount, you know. And then after that, I'm like, she's, she lives near Jacksonville, I guess, ish. You know, Kentucky's not that far. So I decide, you know, I'm gonna go play that Jacksonville tournament. I hadn't played a WBT there. I said, you know, let me go there. We'll be close. Maybe we'll meet up there. Maybe we'll just, you know, make it happen. So I fly to Jacksonville. She is, um, you know, she is, uh, She's like on her way to come, you know, again, this is like, this is nuts. Cause right before my bro my buddy Brian is like, I'll bet you 500 bucks she doesn't come. I was like, deal, book. Cause like she was hundred percent in, you know? So like I'm waiting in the hotel for her and it's like 1 a.m. She was supposed to be there already. So like I, now I get a call from her and some dude. Okay, this story gets crazy as I said. So now she's on the road. She said she was on the road. She was driving away from this dude who's like in love with her or whatever and wants to marry her. So now all of a sudden she puts him on the phone and he's like, I asked her to marry me and she's marrying me. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Like I wasn't invested at that point. I'm not like, oh, the love of my life. Hey, my dog is going behind the video game. Come here, Rocky. Don't be silly. That's not, that's dangerous. There's wires over there. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So now I got this, now she's telling me, she's on the side of the road with this guy. He's telling me like, you know, they're in love, they're gonna get married and whatever. I'm like, okay. You know, I wasn't like, it's not like I'm heartbroken. You know, I never actually met the girl. I was just like kind of annoying. So I bought a couple of bottles of wine, you know, <laughs> and plan on having some, you know, interesting conversation and whatnot. Um, so yeah, so that like, at, after that point, I'm like, okay, this is stupid. You know, I'm not gonna like continue to, you know, go on in a relationship for like 10 months with a girl who I've never met before. And you know, can't even talk on Facebook or, you know, on like on FaceTime or whatever, it felt like it was getting a little silly at this point. So then, um, I think it was around November, I, I did the course, my, my, I did this course unrelated to all this stuff. I did a course at Choice Center, which I mentioned before, Brian Ballsbuck did it, a bunch of poker players did it, you know, Bill Perkins, Antonio, and a whole bunch of guys. And they're like, dude, you gotta try it, it'll be great. So I went first weekend, and then the second weekend, the group of us that were all in the class, it was about, it was about 80 of us in the class, and then there's about like 20 of us went out to Blue Martini after, 25 of us kind of celebrate, you know, all we learned throughout the weekend, the great experience that it was, and it really is. It was like an amazing experience. So she tells me, well, uh, yeah, she, so she, you know, the Kentucky girl, she tells me like the day before, she's like, okay, I'm ready to do FaceTime. 
I was like, okay. You know, I'm, at this point, I'm like, whatever. You know, who cares? So she's ready to do the FaceTime thing. So I'm at the Blue Martini. It's at, I'm at a club. It's loud. She's like, we got to do it right now. I'm like, okay. So I go to the, go to the bathroom with the phone. It's kind of whatever. I couldn't really see that well. And so I see her. She's there on the FaceTime. She's kind of shy. She's kind of got her hands like this, you know. I can see her hair and whatnot. And I'm like looking at it. I'm like, I don't know. So let me see your face, you know. And she's like, I'm shy. I'm nervous, whatever. I was like, oh my God, this is just awkward now, right? So hang up on FaceTime. I'm like, okay, good. At least, you know, we know she's not some, you know, you know, we know she's legitimately who she says she is, right? Because, you know, throughout too, like there were several times where I'd ask her to like send me a specific picture just like to check in and make sure this is not some sort of catfish situation or whatever, whether she wasn't who she said she was. Uh, and she would, you know, she'd always send me a picture and whatnot occasionally, um, very specific. And so, you know, um, I never had any question about her being who she was. Then like, after that, at some point, I'm just like at home watching MTV. And MTV had a show on it called Catfish. So Catfish is a show where you have these people who are in these relationships, like online relationships or whatever with like somebody who's like not the person. They're actually posing to be somebody else, right? And I was like, huh. Not that I thought for a second this can t But then I noticed in the show, like one of the ways that they would check was they would use Google Image. So they would take a picture that you know you had, and they would put it in a Google image and see where it would what would come up, right? So it's like ah, just just for you know just to check this out, let me find a picture and see what what pops up, okay? So I put in a picture um, into the Google image of her, and it's like whoa, this is weird. So it connects to like this kind of Russian Facebook like page, in all in Russian and stuff, and it's her, all in Russian, and I'm thinking she doesn't speak Russian. She's not Russian. So then I look and I see like, you know, some of the other pictures and I'm like, that's all her. So now I'm like, this is, this, this messed up. So now I'm pretty much clued in onto like what it is. So I say to her, I was like, text her just, you know, for the sake of it. I was like, okay, we have to FaceTime tomorrow. Like there's no, just we have to tomorrow, FaceTime at five o'clock tomorrow or whatever. She's like, okay. Then at 3.30, she's like, I have something important I need to tell you. I'm like, I'm like, at this point, I'm, and I said to her, it was like, from watching the show too, like I sort of understood and had more of an empathy for like people that would do something like that or why they would do that. So it, was, it allowed me to kind of like come from that place a lot more and say like, whatever it is, I'm sure it's fine. You know, we'll be friends no matter what, right? Basically letting her know that like, I know I've just been catfished for 11 months. So we get on the phone. She's like, she's, she's sad. She's like crying. She's like, I'm not, you know, I'm not 22. I'm not the girl you think I am. I'm not in school. I don't have any response. She's like, I'm 45, <clears throat> married with three kids. 45, married with three kids. And then the best part is she's like, you know, the girl on Twitter that we used to make fun of and you mocked and we mocked her mullet. She's like, that's me. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. So like I'd said, so now I get it, like early on in the, in the whole story, she was like mad at me because I was saying, you know, mean things about her profile picture and I didn't know I was talking to the actual person. So, cause she was gonna like stop it. At one point I remember early on, she's like, you know, I have to focus on school. I don't think we should talk anymore. And that was her way of like getting out of the situation. And then all that, you know, happened with me making fun and she sort of felt like to some degree, like I deserved it a little bit. Um, this <laughs> what a crazy story, right? Is this crazy or what? Did you know the whole, all the details, Christian? Not all the details. Mm, mm. So, so the good news is, after well, the, the, this is kind of the strange part is she sort of hadn't thought that because you know we spent a lot of time talking and all this kind of stuff. She still kind of had a thought that we could be a thing, and I was like, well, no, <laughs> you know, you're married with three kids, and we can be friends. And so, I still hear from her. I don't know, once every few months, here and there. I wish her well. She sends me a picture of her kids. So I actually know who the real person is now. Um, you know, and uh, it was just one of those situations where, you know, you watch Catfish and you think that, that would, n I would never be that dumb, right? Cause I'm not a dumb guy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but um, she was really good. She had her therapist talk to me. Guess who her therapist was? Her therapist was her. She used a different voice that I could not recognize being her. She had a guy on the road, you know, on the way, like pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm in love with this girl, da da da. 
made up. That was like her brother or something she had in on it. The girl that I saw, this is the best part. The girl that I saw on the FaceTime who like was hiding like this, this was a friend of hers from, from down the street who needed $40 to buy drugs or whatever. So she volunteered to do it just like to show me that it was actually her. So she was like, she held on to this lie for a really long time. Cause she was like, you know, I don't know. It became like a, it was like a relationship. And the jealousy thing was like, like kind of weird. Like to see, to think back, like how could you be so jealous when, you know, this was not even a thing. So the whole thing, like after it happened, it was like a movie at the end. I'm like, oh, I thought back to all the different spots in the times. I'm like, aha, uh -huh. how did she print her name on the plane ticket? And I'm like, I guess, you know, technology, she was really good at this stuff. And then realizing like every time if I liked a picture or something like that of some girl, she was on it on all the time. So she must have been online like 24 seven. But anyway, so that was the story of my catfish experience, 11 months. So I highly recommend if for any of you who go through this, use Google image, right? <laughs> Demand like FaceTime or speech and don't buy the story of the, uh, she was a very good storyteller. Like could have been a writer because I'm, you know, unless, like I said, I ain't dumb, but uh, she had me going for 11 months, 11 months. Can you believe that? All right. So that's story number one. This is going to be a podcast of interesting stories from my past uh, that are going to relate to a few different things. We're going to get into the golf when we come back. All right. So I'm sitting here with Christian Sanchez. This is the guy who puts together the um, podcast, the vlogs, the whole deal. He loves being on camera, don't yeah. you? Oh, yeah. It's your favorite right thing here. in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so the story between me and Christian, we met years ago. They used to have all kinds of golf tournaments. We had, was the World Series of Golf? Is that what yeah. it's called? Yeah. So the World Series of Golf was this thing that like at that time, Full Tilt Poker was putting on. And uh, you could have a caddy and it was like, you're in groups with different people. And Eric Lindgren, you guys know Dog, of course. Um, he said, you know, this guy, he, he'd be great for you to work with, right? I was like, okay, I need a caddy. I don't know. So Christian, um, you know, volunteers to, or not doesn't volunteer. I'm about paying. <laughs> it wasn't free. Um, so he just, you know, he works with me and, uh, we would, I think the first time we played in the match, we lost in like whole seven against Alan Cunningham or something like that. Yeah. It was like a weird format. So it wasn't like regular golf where you just play the holes out. It was like, there was betting involved. So you say there's on the first tee, it's a hundred dollar ante. So all four people put up a hundred after the tee shot. Say a guy's like way in front, he could say I'm betting 300 or I'm betting all in. And the other players, if they didn't want to match the bet, they just fold and now they just lose the hole. So I didn't have a long game, which we already knew. Yeah. So basically the, our strategy was like, get on a green and just pound it, even if we're behind, because it was like our only chance to win. So I think I got into a spot with Alan Cunningham and I just choked, right? Missed like a five foot. Yeah, missed a short one. And this is before he had any chance to work with me. So at the time I had my swing he wasn't going to like change my swing in a few days. But I remember immediately after that, we went straight to the range. And then like, what is the first thing that we did? Remember? Well, I'm in posture grip. Posture grip, yeah. yeah. Like mean, we... my grip was this grip. So what is it called? Weak? That's weak, yeah. right? Weak, right. So, so I started working with Christian. And um, back then, you wouldn't believe like the kind of money we played for. Like there was just, remember it was like when full tilt money was rolling in, golf money was rolling in. Yeah. Like everybody was golfing. And, one of the first times we went out, like we sort of have like what you do with a, with a caddy, you know, like Phil Ivey had whenever everyone was, you make an agreement. Some you just pay a salary, others you might like give a piece of the gambling winnings or whatnot. So we had a match early on, the first time, who was that against? Was that Patrick? Patrick was the first match. Well, yeah. Who was he with? Was it with uh, Nick? It was Nick. Yeah. So we're playing these guys, Patrick and Nick, big dudes. They hit it freaking a mile and a half. And Christian is playing for like ridiculous money. <laughs> <laughs> His first thing. And I don't know how good he is, like, I just know that he's, you know, was good and he's like, you know, junior pro, whatever, but he like, he doesn't hit it as long as these guys. So like, what was it like? Well, how much were we playing for? Do you remember? We were playing for, I think it was like 45,000 a hole. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had played, you know, yeah, I had worked for some other poker players. So I had played, you know, some $5,000 Nassau's and stuff before, but you know, get up on that first tee and find out we're playing for 45,000 a hole. You know, I'd only been working with Daniel for about three weeks, so, you know, it was a lot of pressure, and it showed. <laughs> I oh. think I think I was, I think I was seven over through six, and we were down, like, a couple hundred thousand, like, pretty, I played pretty quick. I remember you did hit a good shot on number 13, the three wood, with all the pressure, and you curled it in and, all, like, almost made the green or whatnot, but... That's how we started off. And how did we end up? We didn't do good. No, we came, we actually oh, won that day. We, did, we won that yeah. day. 
He shot it because <laughs> that was because of me. Yeah, well, I think you, I you shot. Had, like, you had a good day after that. Those first seven holes, I played the next like twelve holes. Yeah. I think I was supposed to shoot. Holes, like, yeah. I was supposed to shoot a, between ninety two and ninety three. I shot eighty one because that's what I do. I come with the pressure, and so obviously, so we won that match. Um, and that used to be on, on the high stakes golf. Like we had a show. Yeah. I wonder if we could find that footage. It's out and put there. Put that up. Yeah. Yeah. Because those were some good some good times. Yeah. Some crazy matches. So then what, what developed out of that, I think, right? We didn't play another match with them too until the scramble, right? Yeah. So about a month later, we played some scramble matches against so, them. So, so in, in essence, that was really the best thing that could happen for us was for us, you know, for me especially to start that way because that's what those guys remembered me playing like, you know, those those first six or seven holes where I, you know. Didn't look very good. Because you're supposed to be shooting par yeah. from there. Yeah. And you were like shooting bogey golfer style. Yeah. Pro, cause, so the pressure got to you. Oh, yeah. It was tough. Early mm-hmm. on. Yeah, 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 early <laughs> on. So then, um, so back then we used to play with uh, this guy Ted Park, Sam Saharath, a buddy from Toronto, and a guy named Svi Groisman from Toronto also. Um, and we'd play, you know, we'd play like matches and all that kind of stuff. And none of these, none of these guys were any good. Like, you know, a little better than me hit the ball a little bit longer, but none of us were good. Like, none of us were good. And so how did it come about? We were always a TPC summer, right? Yep. And so, like, they're always there, and Patrick's always like, so, like, why don't we play scramble match? Me and Nick and, you know, who was the third? I can't remember. It was him, Nick, and... Him, Nick, and Jimmy. Oh, and Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah, so Jimmy, so him, Nick Rainey, and Jimmy, who's, like, the nuts, right? He's super good. We, they wanted to play like a, a scramble against us for really big money. And I'm thinking, well, Ted, we call him Ted, <laughs> I can't even say what we call him. We call him, well, his nickname back then, and I didn't make this up just for the record, so don't freaking hate on me. This isn't, his name was Teddy Parkstein, and this was based on his negotiating skills, right? <laughs> so what was, do you remember what the match was that we originally got negotiated? Uh, the first, well, yeah, it was the four of us, so Sam and Ted, the two of us. Playing from the white tees against the three of them playing from the, I think they were just blue tees in the beginning. And it was a scramble. So we just play, that means basically everyone hits a ball and you just play the best ball. Yep. And then the big edge we had in that was we got an extra putt. Yeah. Right? So like on, they get to the green, I would say on average, they were about 10 to 15 yards closer than us per putt that we had. Would that be accurate? A feet. Feet, yeah, what I said. Feet, yeah, you said yards. Okay, ten feet. So yeah. we were always behind them on the greens, but you get an extra putt. And the one thing that we had, we didn't have big hitters. Like I, I think when we had one of the couple matches, I didn't even tee off because there was no point. Because like if he didn't hit a good one, then you know we're screwed anyway. Um, or if he did hit a good one, there was no sense in me actually hitting one. Um, and the one thing that we had going for us was every one of us, myself. Um, I was speaking of putting. I just had that. No, we'll talk about that later. Um, just played the mini series of putting or the major series of putting. It was a blast. Could have won, literally. Tag team right here. Made it to the quarterfinals. That's um, getting off tangent now. So, um, so yeah, the big thing, the big edge we had is we had an extra putt. On top of that, that whole week, Nick Rainey, who was one of their, you know, he was really good as well. That whole week, he was doing prop bets where he played like only with his driver, right? Like I actually played a match with him. We played even. He played with his driver only. So he would be like on a, 100 yard par three and he's like hitting a driver and then when he got in the bunker remember he had to go backwards yeah. so he had to hit it out of the bunker backwards with the driver but here's what he didn't realize is that he'd been putting all week with the driver right i had been practicing for the match so he didn't putt well on the day of the match right like he didn't make any putts the only person that made putts patrick made no putts you know nick made hardly any and then jimmy always like eventually like the pressure's on you right so the, all the pressure's on Jimmy all the time to make the last putt, and he was doing a good job for a while. Yeah. But then, what did? How did we do in that first round? We were down at one point. Yeah, we were. Well, we played like multiple days, and it was it was it was always back and forth. Like the matches were all pretty close, but then, you know, well, that, we shot that, like fifty eight. We shot like fifty nine or something. And lost. Yeah. We shot we shot sixty and lost. They shot fifty nine, I think. No, that and was then, the first day. And then this, I think the second day we shot we actually shot sixty one and one. Yeah, because they really blew yeah, up. Yeah, they blew up. And so that match, it was like over a few days, and we beat them out of stacks of uh, flags, as you can <laughs> say. And, and, and we won, I don't know, I think it was like eight, 900000 that first year we won. Yeah. And of course, everyone had a piece on the team and whatnot. And then, like, we didn't hear from another match from them for about what? Like another, like till pretty much the next, next, fall, next spring. Yeah. 
And then the next spring, they propose a new match. Same idea, except, oh, instead of Nick, right? Instead of Nick, it was like, we have this guy, Miko. He doesn't hit it very far. Miko doesn't hit it very far. And we're like, I'm not so sure how much I believe this, but whatever. Um, make a long story short, Miko hits it freaking a ton. There's a hole on number, I think it was 14, right? 13. 13, 13, where there's like bunkers on the left. Like there's nobody goes over all the bunkers because it's stupid. Nobody can hit it that long. He could just crush it, what, like 370 yeah. over the bunkers? He was, he was low. Yeah, so they brought in a ringer, essentially, right? Which was going to, like, help them win the match. Um, and luckily, we just uh, we putted lights out. Yeah. We putted lights out and we yeah. crushed them. I think that last, we beat them by, like, three on the last we shot. We, that time, we lost the first day by one. And then the second day, we ended up shooting 56. I, I putted well. I was actually, I remember yeah. being a good I remember there was one hole, number three, which is like a... Par five, but it's a par four when the pros play it, but we played it as a par five. We were like 35, 40 feet, and a couple putts, you know, because you know, you, once once like one of our guy putts, the next guy can see the line, he putts. I remember them being behind because they have like a spotter watching us, and we had a spotter watching them. But you can all see them in the middle of the green because they're playing up behind us. And I remember specifically doing this on purpose, but like we, I made the like 35, 40 footer, right? Snake putt all the way up and down the hills. I made the 35, 40 footer. And like, I did the most obnoxious celebration of all time. Yeah! Woo! Yeah! And I wanted them to see it because I thought it might like just break their spirits a little bit. And I don't know that it did, but it was really fun being that kind of jackass. I felt like Havad Khan, bulldozer <laughs> back in the day. But um, yeah, there, so that was good. We, we beat Patrick again that year for I think even more money than the first time. And uh, uh, the reason I wanted to do these golf stories too, so I remember Brandon Adams, he just did, uh, Remco podcast has up, has up Remco and Poker, and he was talking about the like, golf stories that he had with Patrick and some others. And I had one with Brandon Adams that I thought was so funny I had to share. And you weren't with me by then, right? No. So this was before you. This was before me. Yeah. How did I possibly win this? I had no idea. So I'm playing Brandon, and Brandon. So here's what Brandon typically was known to do. Brandon was known to overestimate his own ability. Would that be fair to say? Or you don't know because you never played that. Yeah. That's what I. That's what I heard anyway. Is that. He thought he was better. He was probably capable of being a lot better than he was playing, but like he just wasn't playing that well. So there was a, a front nine where I was, you know, I'm like much worse than he was. And I think I shot like a 44 and he shot the same, I think, a 44. And he says, I'll tell you what, I'll bet the back even stroke play, but I'll lay you three to one on 25K. So basically after his 25K to win 75K. And at the time, this is even before Christian, on these holes, I like, I didn't go out of bounds much. I just was like at all pretty much. I couldn't hit it that far. So I was straight and short, straight and short. Pretty safe, simple game that was gonna shoot around bogey golf. But Brandon, you know, and on the front nine, he's a little bit more of a sprayer. Like he can hit it long, but sometimes he hits it left, sometimes he hits it right. So we start, so I say, okay, so stroke play even. I'm getting three to one odds on this bet. 10th hole, um, I think we push. We both make bogey on the first hole. And then on number 11, he goes up first, pulls his first drive way left into the houses, like way left into the houses. So now he gets up there again, comes like off the tee, pulls another one way left into the houses, right? So now he's lying, he's lying, four. So now he's hitting five. Hit five. <laughs> he's hitting five. Now he hits one right into the houses. So he's lying six, seven. Six. Six. Seven. So finally he hits seven. He's now he's in the middle of the fairway, lying seven. Okay? Now the green is like straight ahead. You can't hit it OB from here. You 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 just can't. I mean it's like not even a thing. There are houses way right, but like you'd have to like fully you'd have to be aligned way wrong and slice the ball on top of that, right? You know the hole I'm talking about. Yeah. There's just no way you can hit the house. Yeah. He did <laughs> twice. <laughs> Make a long story short, he made like a 13 or a 15 on the second hole. Like, obviously, total choke, right? Because the money was big or whatever. And, you know, he didn't, you know, and then the rest of the way, like, I mean, I basically just had to bogey out, you know, or whatever. He couldn't, couldn't win. So that was my Brandon Adams experience. I don't know that we played after that. Um, but that was before you. And before I met Christian, it's easy. I could easily say that I was stuck millions of dollars playing golf. Because what I would do was I would go up to the tee and I'd be like, okay, well, how many shots are you giving me? And they'd be like, oh, four. I'm like, okay. I basically just said yes to everyone. I'm like, how much? 50,000, 50,000? Like, these guys remember it, and they're like, Chip Reese, who had a bum knee, he came out to golf, he couldn't even walk. Doyle Brunson's on a cane. I mean, these guys were like, I was the big sucker, right? So they're just coming out and just getting the feasting on the free money. 
you know, at the end of the day, I'm paying like 500K in flags to all these guys. But uh, at that point, I didn't realize like, so these guys are lying. <laughs> you know what I mean? So Mike Sexton, who I'm friends with, and I know that I, there was a time when I played with him and Phil Ivey. Were you there for that? Uh, I don't know. Sex, I mean, I was there for quite a few Ivey matches, but I don't Ivey know and Sexton. Mike. Those is when you would have remembered. Yeah. You would have remembered, yeah. So Mike says, you know, I'm a bogey golfer, right? So I'm like, okay. So we, we play like 10,000 a hole. He's playing much bigger with Phil Ivey. They're playing an even bigger match. I mean, I don't know how we match up, right? So, you know, Mike's a bogey golfer. He birdies number four, three, four, and five. Birdies three in a row, shot a smooth 75. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, bogey golfer. And he's like, ah, it's the best round of my life. That week I played four guys, four different guys. All four of them happened to have the best round of their life. <laughs> well, what are the odds of that, right? Um, so I was like absolutely the biggest sucker. But thankfully, you know, bringing Christian on, like he's a lot more, you're a lot more needy than I am, to say the least. There was a time when we were playing Shadow Creek. I think it was Shadow, yeah, Shadow Creek. And there's like a ruling, right? And David Oppenheim is trying to say that like, it's, I don't know, I don't remember what it was. It was like the yellow line, remember? Drop. Yeah, it was the yellow versus the red line. So what was he claiming? He was claiming that it was, that basically that you couldn't, that he could drop over um, when he couldn't. Like he thought it was. Oh right, so he yeah. could drop over the wall, yeah. but he actually had to come behind it, yeah. right? So I remember David's like, I'll bet you whatever you want on this. I'll bet you whatever you want, you're wrong. And I'm like, Christian, he's like, He's like, are you right on this? He's like, I'm, I'm certain I'm right. I'm like, I got, so I said, so this is, how, this is how I decided how much I'm going to bet David Oppenheim. I was like, would you bet your own money on this? And you're like, yeah. I go, how much? And what did you, I think you said like 5,000. 5, yeah. When he said 5,000, I was like, that's printing. That was absolutely printing. And then, um, of course, Christian was right. And um, uh, I don't remember even if David made that bet. No, you, uh, you you bet you ended up betting five. It was just five thousand. Just five thousand. He right. wanted to bet a thousand, or that was what you guys were talking about. And, and then, then we got we got five. Yeah, yeah. I love when people <laughs> make the bets where they're already drawing dead in. You know, there's a story Mike Mattisau years ago. I think it was against Howard Letter or David Gray. He's in a poker game and he was trying to bet with people like whether Sha Shawshank Redemption had won the Emmy or something, and like they'd already knew that it was true, and he still bet them right. So he lost the bet, and then he, Mike was like, "They cheated me." Like, they told you they knew. You were so vehement about being wrong. So anyway, I always felt comfortable having Christian because one of the key things that would happen to me is before him, I'd be out there and I was a really bad golfer, really bad golfer. And like, if on hole three or four something was wrong in my spring, I'm screwed. I'm just dead. Like, I remember playing Phil Ivey one time at Shadow Creek and he, we were 20,000 20, a hole. I was stuck like 1.2 million, had no chance. And Phil's just shaking his head like, <laughs> Phil was, like felt bad for me. And I remember one time at Shadow Creek too, on the third hole, Phil looked at me because we were playing like six, six, men, six men groups and everyone's betting big. And he's like, what are you doing, bro? <laughs> like, cause I'm making a six thinking that's good. You know, like how do these guys keep making pars and bogeys? Like I, I, I had no idea. So one of the, you know, the great things about having Christian since then is we've gotten all the money back with some gravy. And on top of that, like the big difference is now if something goes wrong with the swing and I'm not doing something. He's like, okay, you're coming usually on flat. It's like, yeah. That was probably the biggest yeah. thing. I would come in, come in flat. Like, I'm coming in just ridiculously flat. Um, but these days, there's no more golf money. Yeah, nobody... It's nobody been a while it. since we've had some, some good matches. Yeah, since that money... Those were different times yeah. when that money was... Well, the, talk about the 80 bet. Oh, the 80 bet! Yeah. <laughs> I forgot. I almost forgot about that. So we were at um, Kona Grill. Me, Eric Lindgren, and Phil Ivey. And a couple other people. We were drinking sake and beers and laughing and giggling and having fun. And somehow I'm like, oh, dude, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm a terrible golfer. I can't break 100 from the Blues. There's like no way. So I'm like, I bet you in a year I could shoot 80 from there. And they start laughing. Like there's no, oh, Ted was there too because he ended up betting too. So make a long story short, I make a dumb drunken bet. I bet like 550,000 that I could shoot 80 from the back tees at TPC Summer. The good news was we set up the rules in such a way where I could shoot as many rounds as I wanted, right? Yeah. So like I could go tomorrow, you know, I just had to do it once. So I hadn't even practiced for like 10, 11 months going into it. And then I'm like, this, oh shit, you know, we only got a month left. So we started, we woke up at like 7 a.m. every day, practiced for like an hour, played 18 holes, practiced like another hour, another 18, practiced another nine. We, we, we went from like 7 a.m. till 8 p.m. And I'd say the first five rounds were like 115, 108, 107, 105. And then I started getting in the 90s. I'm like, okay, we got a shot. And then with like a week out, I'm like, okay, now I'm you know, pretty consistently in the 80s. And this is one where, you know, some of them were like, hey, I don't know if this is fair, but it wasn't stipulated. We, um, 
so now we were pretty close, right? So I'm thinking, okay, if I, if I start off a round badly, we have like you know, a couple weeks left, why bother finish the round? And they didn't say what hole we had to start on. So let's say I have a double bogey, let's say I go par par on one and two and then on number three, I just make a triple bogey or like a quad. I'm like, okay, I'm starting on four fresh, right? It's honor system too, but it's basically 18 holes. Once we start, gotta shoot 80. So on this situation, I ended up starting on one as it worked out, right? No. Oh no, no, because I had to finish on 12. Yeah, we started on 13. We started on 13. So actually that's the, 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 theoretically 13 is the worst place to start because the stretch from 13 to 17 was the easiest by far. And typically if you make a bet like that, you want to start with the hard holes first, see how you do and not waste your time. Yeah. Well, I think I made two birdies. You made two, yeah, you were two under through five, I think. Two under through five, yeah. so that's a pretty good start. Yeah. And um, I was supposed to play Ivy that day a match. And then like we get around you know, the, the turn and he's on the putting green waiting to play and he's like, and I'm like, we can't play, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the 80 bed. And he's like, whatever. So now he's like, he hears I'm two under and all of a sudden, with, so with three holes to go, all I need to do, a nine, which is the easy one, so easy part. Four, four holes to go. Four holes to go. Yeah. And, and nine is, but anyway, I, so I, I par, I need to bogey up, right? From, from eight, eight, yeah. From, from eight, no, nine, 10, 11, 12. I think, yeah, you, or you could have had a double, I think. But you end up making a, no, I think I had a messed up nine. And I doubled nine, but yeah. I, that's why it screwed me yeah. up. Because, so I needed to bogey out from eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 10, 11, 12 are the three longest holes, by far. So it's like the worst possible stretch. By that point, people knew that I was in contention, so there was like, I don't know, 30 carts out there, people sweating the match. So on number nine, the easy one, hit a good drive, get a decent second shot. Now my third shot to the green, falls a little short, drops in the bunker, hit that bunker shot over the other side, then I'm on and then I, like, I make a seven. So yeah. I double the hole, which really screws me up because now I need to make par on 10, 11, or 12, which is really, yeah. really tough for me. Yeah. So number 10, good, decent drive, I made, uh, and I never, I, I, the thing is I couldn't even hit greens. Yeah. So I'm hitting driver, three wood, leaving myself like 20, 30 yards short, and then just chipping and putting. Chipping and putting happened to be the best part of my game. So on number 10, I have about 25 feet for par. Yeah, but maybe, maybe 20 feet. 20 feet for par. Left to right. Left to right, big breaking putt, make it. So now all I gotta do is bogey bogey, and I win this big bet. So I, uh, again, on number 11, I hit a nice drive, get a good three wood, and then the most safe part of my game, the best part of my game is just my chipping from there. I never screw it up, except I pulled it long, long and left. So now I have this like monster putt that I need two putt from. Hit it about five, six feet past, need to make the comebacker, I make the comebacker. So now going into number 12, beautiful drive, beautiful approach, just off the green, it's like game over. I gotta do the best thing about you know, my chip and putt, so I, I do it again. I yank it to the, the thing yeah, and long. leave myself like a super long putt. Miss that one, of course. And I leave myself way long, like six, seven feet. And this is it. Like this is exactly for the 80 and all the carts watching. My was so nervous. I remember the putt. Like I remember hitting the putt like this. Like my body just kind of, well, if you're listening, you won't see this, but I kind of like fell down to my knees and somehow the ball dropped and I shot 80. And I won that bet. And of course, right after that, Phil Ivey and the boys wanted to get even because they lost a lot of money. So he's like, you gotta spot me like three, four strokes. Da, da, da. So make a long stretch. I shot 81 the very next round against Phil yeah. and I broke even because that's how we matched up. He's <laughs> like, well, that's how you shoot. You're an 80 player. I'm like, that was lights out. So that was like a bit of history from our golf stories. We sum it up with, I guess, what we just had recently and sort of reignited my passion for golf a little bit. This weekend, we were part of the major series of putting. And if you have a chance to play in this next year, you absolutely should. It was a blast. Josh Beckett, baseball player, Marty Fish, professional tennis player, and some actual pros from Sweden, some like really good putters, um, were in this uh, you know championship. And I hadn't we hadn't practiced at all, really. Yeah. I have a green in the backyard. We hit a few putts. So we go out there and play a practice round. It's 18 putting holes, and they're all you know they can be pretty tough. In my practice round, I make a seven on one of the holes because it's just like falls off, right? Yeah. So I shoot plus eight in the practice round. I'm like, well, I'm dead because you gotta be in the top 16 to make the cut. And I'm like, there's just no way a plus eight's gonna do it. Well, you know, I got a little bit of a feel. The very first hole of my actual round, the very first hole, I make a four, on a, and it's a part two. I make a four, I screwed it up. So I'm like, I'm screwed. But luckily, you know, I settled down from there and I ended up staying at plus two for the rest of the round. So I, I played even. The very next round, I was popping a lot of birdies, but I, my speed was so far off because I hadn't been practicing. Shot plus one on the second round. The third round of all the golfers, pros included, I had the low round. I shot minus four, minus three on the back, 
and I ended up minus one in the, um, what do you call that? Which play? The stroke play. Stroke play. Yeah. So I ended up the 10 seed. So I'm playing this guy who's the 7 seed, and this is funny. So this guy, the day before, you know, he sees me out there, and he's like, he gives me his card, and he goes, ah, oh, hey, if you're here, I'm, I'd like to give you a putting lesson. And I'm thinking, putting lesson? I'm the best putter in the world, bro. Because this guy, he was very, like, very nice guy, but also very confident in his skills. So I end up matched up against him because he's the seven seed, as it turns out. And we go up to the starters, you know, and like the way that this works, it's match play now. So if you beat the guy in hole number 14, it's over. You know, like if, he, if you're up by like five and there's only four holes to play, you don't have to play the rest of them. So he's saying like this, he's like, oh, hey, you know, are we allowed to play the whole 18? I'd like to play with him as much as I possibly can. Just feeling like it's going to be, a, you know, he's going to destroy me. So he just wanted to have the fun of playing with me. Okay. So... In the first, what, three out of the first four holes I find, I birdie? I birdie three yeah. out of the first four? I have him like, um, I have him dormy on number, dormy means he can't win anymore. He hits, hits his putt on 15, right? 15? Yeah. 15, he doesn't make his putt, he concedes. So, you know how he said, like, let's play the rest out? He didn't have any interest in playing the rest out. So I was like, I knew I was going to beat him too. Like, anyone who came in that confident, I, I just knew it. And then I ended up playing the guy who was the two seed. Uh, wasn't it Richard Lochner? Yeah. Richard Lochner. And Richard Lochner, absolutely. He didn't even play good. He was one under um, through the front. And I just blew up. My speed, man. I was like That's short, better. long. That's all it is. But like, it made me feel like, well, the thing is too, we're kind of a team. And for a lot of the tournaments, you can't have a caddy. You have to play yourself. But in this one, you were allowed. And he lines the putts up for me. Specifically, like literally, like puts the line on the ball. All I do is keep my head down and knock them in. And we're a good team that way. Um, but I really believe, like, with practice, we could have easily have contended with those guys. Yeah. Like, we're that good, man. Yeah. We're insanely good. <laughs> Freaking greatest ever. So that's a little bit about the golf stories. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about GTO, my journey to GTO, some of the poker stuff I've been learning. Also, I want to go over some of the podcasts that Remco Rinkema does. Again, if you haven't been listening to those, you're really missing out on Poker Central Podcast. Find that in iTunes. Um, I think on the website, too, Poker Central, they're probably up there, too. But when we come back, talk a little bit about what I've been learning. Later, guys. All right. So as you guys, as I said before, I'm doing what's called a PSP, Personalized Strategic Plan. Part of that is bulking up, trying to gain some muscle. Along with that comes a little bit of like lack of definition, a little bit of a, not actually, I haven't really been getting much fatter. It just seems that way, like percentage-wise, body fat percentage-wise. Um, but so I'm in the midst of that. We're in week six. We do the shortcut to size, the Jim Stepani shortcut to size. Trying to eat as much as I can. It's just hard, man. It's hard to eat that much. I don't really like eating. I mean, you're just a Christian. You can't, you can't eat at all. Like this guy, he benches more than me and he's like 135 pounds. I don't know how he does it. Um, but the main thing that I've been wanting to focus on um, this three months was poker study because at the Poker Masters, I had an opportunity to play with Stefan Sotmeyer, uh, a lot of the Germans, a lot of the great young players in the game today. And put, to put it mildly, they're extremely good. And... Um, they're good at not just game theory optimal play. They're very good at exploiting as well. And they're also, this is where I think Phil Hellmuth really undersells or just under, just lacks the understanding of realizing like they're also very good at picking up on tells. You know, Phil Hellmuth likes to call it white magic. Well, these guys have white magic because they study really hard. They study not only the game and not all of them. I'm not going to mention who I think is really, really good at it, but I don't want to give away too much information. But there are some of them who are very, very perceptive and they're picking up on body language tells. And then you have others who say, for example, a guy like Ike Haxton. Ike Haxton focuses, I would say, solely on doing his best to play as close to game theory optimal as possible. Um, what is game theory optimal, right? A lot of, you know, the, the, the GTO term gets thrown on a lot. And um, I guess the best way to describe it, now I've been working with two guys named Matt and MJ, who they did the Live at the Bike commentary uh, and they've been coaching me on, well, specifically on GTO baselines, essentially, like learning what is GTO and then learning how to incorporate exploitative play into that, right? So what is GTO? And they describe it this way to me. It was like, okay, so imagine, I like this analogy best. If you were going to play rock, paper, scissors, right? What would be the GTO percentage to throw rock, scissors, and paper, right? So if you're playing against somebody else, you know, I, obviously the correct percentage would be 33, 33, 33, right? One third, and then you can't get exploited, you can't lose, except you also theoretically can't win either because you know, you're not really exploiting anyone else. So, so, I, so theoretically, if two players were to play exactly the same GTO, like 
identical GTO, like actual genuine GTO, Game 3 Optimal, then they would break even. Like no player could win. So um, what the best players do in the world is they take game theory as a baseline and then they look for times to deviate from what the baseline play would be. So for me, my whole career, 20 years of play, my brain is 1 billion percent exploitative, okay? It always has been. I've always been looking at poker from the perspective of how can I exploit what my image is, what my opponent's perception is of me, what my opponent's mistakes are, um, always been playing. And so what that's done is, from a fundamental standpoint, it's allowed me, for years before players were this good, to kind of do whatever I wanted pre-flop. Like, I could play a 6-4 suited under the gun because, I mean, I was exploiting so 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 strongly post-flop. Like, um, you know, I was going to do a video about this, like a YouTube video, but I'm just going to talk about it here. And essentially, like, I look, you know, the evolution of hand reading looks something like this. Back in the old days, right, um, you raise under the gun, player under the gun plus one, three bets you, okay? You can narrow his range down to aces, kings, queens, ace, king. Ace, queen, he's folding sometimes or flatting. Jacks, he's actually flatting some queens sometimes. Definitely not three betting jacks or tens. They're definitely flatting with those. So now that's, so now imagine this player that does this, right? Imagine, okay, now you're playing against the guy whose only three bet range is aces, kings, ace, king, sometimes queens, okay? So you got that now, right? Now, imagine the flop comes 8-3 deuce, rainbow. You check and your opponent checks back, okay? What if I told you that there were players back in the day that that meant that not only did you, there was not, you didn't have to put them on a range of hands, you put them on one specific freaking hand, specifically ace-king. They would never check back aces, kings, or queens, never. And they would be checking back ace-king when you call. So you raise under the gun, they three bet you, you call, they put you on a strong range. So by the turn, provided an ace or a king doesn't come, you can play perfectly against him because you, you know, remember, you know, you know those videos where you see me doing these reads where I'm like, what do you got? King nine, you got ace nine, you got pocket sixes. It was much easier back then because people played their hands in a much more straightforward manner. So when I thought about doing the YouTube video, and I'll just do it here, it's like, I thought about the evolution of hand reading. It used to be as simple as, okay, um, my hand versus their hand, right? So how does my hand do against the hand that I think they have? Very simple. Then it developed into like, how does my hand do against their range of hands, right? So that was like stage two. How does my hand do against the range of possible hands that they could have? And there was software developed like Poker Stove and other things where you could input data, where you put your hand, you put them on the range, and it'll show you like how you do against your range of hands, right? Well, that's evolved to the next level now, which at the highest level, uh, the way in which people are thinking about the game is my range against your range. So rather than looking at how you're going to play the hand from the basis of what your hand actually is, you're thinking about, okay, what can I bet here based on my the entirety of the range of hands that I could have here, right? So in order to not be too exploitable. So for example, um, well, I'm not gonna get into too many nitty gritty examples, but if you understand what I'm saying, now you're in a spot where you're thinking, okay, um, I'm not just continuing on this turn based on the hand that I have. I have to think about what is the constructed range that I have look like, okay? And what percentage of that how often should I be betting and how often should I be checking? What hands should I have in the range of hands that I check? What hands should I have in the ones that I bet? And the last couple of years at the high stakes, like the high roller events, the games evolved so much in large part because of solvers. Um, solvers have allowed these top geniuses to incorporate the knowledge of like solving situations. Like they can get to a situation and say on this turn, you can, you know, put input like three different bet sizes, for example, and it will tell you which is the closest or which is the most profitable, which is the GTO baseline. What does the mixed strategy look like? You can look at a game tree and say, okay, you should be raising with, you know, King Jack 25% of the time, folding it, you know, the other 75. Very, very specific, right? So at the highest levels, that is a big part of how the best players in the game today are playing. And now again, I've, re I've, I've referenced... Remco's podcast a few times because I think it's really worthwhile listening. Um, and he did a back-to-back -back with Bryn Kenny and Dominic Nietzsche, 
who Dominic Nietzsche just won himself the high roller at the World Series Poker Europe, so congratulations to Dominic. And Bryn Kenny, of course, who's having an incredible year. Now, you look at these two players, and they couldn't possibly be more, any, any more different. You know, no matter how you look at it, these guys are like nothing alike in terms of the way that they play, the way that they think, and their approach to the game. If you heard Bryn during the podcast, he was talking about a game of like reading people. He was talking about a game of like confidence, about, you know, exploitative play, and just like, you know, they don't know how I think, and he's, you know, adapting. Dominic told a very different story, one far more based in, you know, game theory, optimal play, you know, um, and, a th you know, a belief that, you know, in two years from now, at the highest level, you're going to be see people, you're going to see people like, you know, through solvers and through using this, be forced to essentially like, you know, try to be as tellless as possible. You know, the guys you notice with the hoodies, they're putting them up by their neck, hiding their neck. You've got, um, for the most part, pretty stoic, robotic play. And, you know, according to Dominic, he believes that uh, the best players in the world will be those that are the, the closest to game theory often because nobody plays, like, nobody plays GTO. A lot of people strive to, but frankly, it's also, hmm, for the most part, especially if you're playing smaller events, it's actually not the best approach. Against smaller, like, lower limit players, you should be playing much more exploitatively. And what I mean by exploitatively in this sense is, like, you don't have to worry as much about playing from my range versus your range. You can play a lot more from my hand versus their range. And you can, uh, you can adapt because you can assume that at the lower limits, people are not going to exploit you. Because every time you do that, right, every time you deviate where you say instead of playing my range against your range and you go my hand specifically, when you deviate like that, you become exploitable. Especially if your opponents start to pick up on some of those tendencies. And over the years, over 20 years of play, it's clear to me that a lot of the high rollers have picked up on a lot of tendencies that I have, um, both physically and um, in terms of just you know my approach to playing certain situations. So I've been really grinding, and I want to say that um, it is extremely tough. It is very, very hard, these concepts that I'm learning from these guys. And I want to say first and foremost that both Matt and MJ do an incredible job of teaching. Um, they're, I think it's called Hybrid Poker, right? Their website's Hybrid Poker? It's Hybrid Poker, right? Hybrid Poker? Well, whatever. Hybrid Poker. I think it's Hybrid something. You can follow them too on Instagram. One is MJ Poker, the other is Avoid the Nine. And um, I'm working with them exclusively right now. And Matt is extremely good. He like, comes from the computer scientist background. He, um, uh, very good at using solvers and, you know, figuring out, you know, he understands game three optimal play at a very, very high level. And so he instills and drills in these concepts to me. MJ is very, very helpful in sometimes taking what Matt says, which is very, very high level stuff. And I'm like, huh? Oh, what you talking about, Willis? Hold on. MJ's very good at coming from a more explicit, from a more like relatable sometimes. Like he can sort of, you know, be the um, the bridge to helping me fully understand and drill the concept home into my head. And essentially what this is all doing for me is it's giving me a baseline for not changing what makes me a great poker player. That is always going to be, like my skills or my skill set is always going to be what separates me from my opponents for the most part. What it's going to do, or what it has been doing, and I've been working really hard on it, is allowing me to just be aware of thinking about hands in a different way where I'm like, okay, so I'm deviating right now. Like before, I didn't think about that. I'm just like, I'm playing this hand like this because this guy's doing this. I'm playing this because this guy thinks I'm too tight. Or I'm playing this because I'm, I'm gonna three bet here because they don't think I three bet enough in this spot. I'm like, there's no actual, um, I guess you would say like game theory balance in that. It's just me guessing for the most part. And guessing just isn't going to do well against guys who are routed in theory at such a high level. So understanding that I am going to deviate based on physical tales, they've shown me really intricate ways of how to do that. And it's like really been eye-opening. Um, it's difficult for someone like me who's been playing poker for 20 years and thinking about the game in a certain way and essentially having to start thinking about it in a different way. Like for example... Counting combos, I don't know. I never even understood what the hell that was. Like, I remember actually it was kind of an eye-opener. No, I want to say this. Too many eye-openers I don't give away. But, um, uh, you know, understanding, like, I didn't even know how to count combos. I didn't know that was a thing. Like, I didn't care. I'd be like, this guy either has this, this, or this. I'm like, I'm like, well, how many combination of hands are there? I never even thought like that. But at the highest levels, that's the way these guys are thinking. And I will say this. Um, I felt like both Dominic and Bryn were essentially right in what they were saying in that, you know, Brain is right and it takes confidence and uh, the game will never be at a place where it's only robots, I don't think. I think that physical tells will all be a, always be a part of the game. 
Uh, I think Dominic's right, though, that we're definitely trending towards, at the highest levels, a game of, like, you know, range versus range GTO battles, which um, I thought Remco was, like, saying, well, wouldn't that be boring because there's not a lot of bluffs? There's actually a ton of bluffs. Like, if you're actually playing Game Theory Optimal, you'd be surprised how often that strategy dictates that you should be bluffing to be balanced in certain situations. So I would say, if anything, if somebody was playing truly GTO, they would be bluffing more than what we're seeing now, which is very makes for very exciting poker. Um, but anyway, what Dominic was saying, I, I agree with for the most part, but I also believe that he somewhat undersold the human element and um, a guy like Bryn Kenny's ability to continu continue to be competitive against these guys who are using solvers and doing it with a little bit of confidence. And the one thing that I would stress to Bryn, and I've been there in what? 20 years of poker, I've run really good, I've run bad, I promise, I've had both. Um, I've won player of the year several times, I've been on top of the world. Uh, in 2004, my game was so far ahead of everybody else, it just literally was, especially in tournament poker. The things I was doing were not common, people didn't understand it, and it was actually, frankly, quite easy. And I think part of it helps when you're hitting hands and you're winning flips, and Bryn this year, um, he's got a lot of confidence. I hope that he's aware that part of that is built into a really good run as well. So like just for example, you know, at the Aria tournament, one of the 100, the 100K, he raised it up under the gun, went call, call, small blind called. Scott Siva re-raised the big. He jammed 9-10 suited. Scott had pocket aces. He won with the 9-10. He went, this was early in, then he went, you know, in midway through the tournament, then he went, went, ended up coming second place, right? Now, that's a big result. That was like, you know, he, I, overall, I'm sure his play was fine against Scott Siever. You know, Scott's known to do that, but point is, is like, he wins this massive pot, looks like, you know, you know, genius, and maybe the play is genius overall, just in this case, he's very, very lucky to win. And, and I can say with true honesty, because I've been in this game for 20 years, that um, as much as during the Poker Masters, I was outplayed for sure in the last one by uh, Schill Hobble, by, by Sondheimer, um, by Scott Siever as well. I was outplayed in several pots throughout. Um, also leading, like the entire week, I was actually very unlucky. Like I've actually been very unlucky. Like I've done worse than players who are like full amateurs in terms of results because, you know, flips. Like it's actually a thing. So one of the dangerous things, and I think Dominic brings up a very valid point in his podcast when he said that confidence can be dangerous because if you become so confident, that you think you've got it all figured out, you stop working and you stop studying. And what ends up happening is, by default, your game suffers because everyone else is studying and getting better. And I can say that's absolutely, has been true for me, oh, my little pups, um, several times in my career, after 2004, 2005. It just honestly, it was kind of boring because it was too easy. I am more passionate about poker now than I've ever been because it's not easy. Because for, for frankly, these guys are better than me. Um, at the at, you know at the very high at the high rollers like I'm still going to be one of the best players in any field that um, you're, you're incorporating some really weak plays because my exploitative play I think is much better than frankly some of the guys who uh, you know are better poker players than me especially against each other like I'm still going to do better I think in a field like you know the 125 Aria Knightley which I'm actually thinking about playing just for some practice because I'm really jonesing to play. Um, but yeah, so the journey to GTO has been very, very difficult for me. It's been very hard. There have been times where I'm like, man, I'm not sure I can do this. And you know, that's usually how we start the session. And by the end of it, I'm like, got it, I get it. And it's opened up um, some new ways of thinking about the game. So I'm super excited to, again, not focus on um, the number of flips that I've lost because it's irrelevant. I wanna focus on the, the reality of, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't luck that I didn't win that last event. It was, I got outplayed. You know, Stefan bluffed me in a big spot. He value bet me in a big, he bluffed me and I folded. He bet big and, and I called like, and he, he had it both times. Like a lot of that's run good, you know, and a lot of that's, you know, situational and, you know, certain cards have to roll off. But overall, it's like, that's what it takes to be, you know, to be able to compete with these guys. You have to be, and I, and I, I want to say this and I hope that, I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to kill people's action here, but the truth is, like, if you are going to jump into one of these high rollers, for the most part, understand this has to be money that, like, you look at as recreational because you're not going to be a favorite for the most part. Even with no rake at the Aria, um, it's very, very difficult to walk into these tournaments and expect to think that, like, you know, oh, yeah, 
I'm sure I'm a plus EV in this field. Because the thing about all these guys, what they're doing is they're playing so often against each other, they're all getting better together. The Germans, I applaud what they're doing because they're actually working as a team, not in the, in the sense of cheating or collusion, but they're all helping each other get better. Back when I was younger, John Jawanda, Alan Cunningham, Phil Ivey, we discussed strategy with each other. We helped each other in every facet of the game. And these Germans, I remember seeing it, like I was in the Poker Masters, I look over at, at Schill Hobble's phone and I'm like, hey, I see my name there, right? And I was like, what is this? So they have like a text chain of all the hands that they're playing. So during the tournament, they know what's going on. And I also heard, and, and I, don't quote me on this, but I heard that they have somebody who like, they send it to, they put it into a solver, the situation, come back so that everybody learns together. They all get better. They root for each other. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think it's important. And that's why I'm so happy to have um, Matt and MJ. And you guys may not know those names. Just It's like, who's Matt and who's MJ? Just some American kids, right? They're really brilliant. Um, I think you will know their names. I think they will be uh, at the forefront of poker teaching. Um, as I said, the concepts are very advanced, but it's palatable the way that in which they teach it. And I think the convo of them working together, like, you know, Matt comes from the super GTO computer scientist, quote unquote nerd guy. And MJ is more of the like, you know, he comes from the exploitative word world and uses GTO and finds ways to like deviate and all that kind of stuff. So as a team, they work really well together. We, um, we work regularly throughout the week. Um, they'll give me, I wouldn't say homework, but they give me some new concepts and principles for me to hammer home. Um, I do that and then we, we move on to the next things. And I feel like I'm, my retention rate is pretty good. Having said that, I haven't uh, tested it at game speed against the best um, since I've been learning. So I'm definitely like, I'm expecting to have some growing pains through it because it's me thinking about poker in a very different way. But I think long term, like with anything, Tiger Woods, and you know this, Christian, there was a point where Tiger Woods was the best in the world. And then he's like, you know what? I'm going to just change my swing. <laughs> Everyone's like, what the hell are you doing? Right? So, because obviously when you do that, you're going to get a little bit worse until you actually get better. And he thought that there was room for improvement. So I expect for me to actually find myself in some situations where I'm going to, it's going to be even more complicated, but that's a good thing and I'll get through it and I'm going to continue to get better because I'm always of a, of a belief that if you're not improving, you're losing, you're getting worse and all of your opponents are going to surpass you. And it's clear to me to say that at the high roller level, you know, the best players, I'm not among them right now. Like, and you know, listen, player feedback's a thing. Like when they do a pool of like 16 guys and they're all picking players and you're not one of the 16 and there's like 22 in the pool, you're like, holy shit, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like feedback from your peers in a sense. And I don't ever look at that much, you know, I'm very different than Helmuth in that way, that I don't look at that and I'm not offended. I'm just like, okay, I appreciate it. And I don't, you know, you guys work hard. Like I, I actually find it insulting to assume that you could be as good as these young kids who are working 12, 14 hours a day on this stuff without putting in the same kind of work. So I plan to do as much as I can to work. I do have a balanced life of other things that I enjoy. So it's a bit of a balance, but I'm dreaming different. I'm dreaming poker again, and I'm really, really enjoying it. So um, that's my journey to GTO. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the World Series of Poker Europe, um, Phil Helmuth, Chris Ferguson, and the tweet. So we'll be right back. All right, we're going to round this podcast up with a sort of look at what happened at the World Series of Poker Europe. Obviously, um, Chris Ferguson won his sixth bracelet, uh, winning the, uh, pretty much locking up the player of the year. I think it would be hard for him not to win at this point. Um, and uh, after winning, Phil Helmuth posted a picture with Chris Ferguson and a bracelet and like all positivity, and I can't remember whatever what else he wrote in the tweet. And the reaction was... Basic, pretty close to unanimous, like WTF, Phil? Like, what is this? And so, you know, um, Phil mentions he's a forgiving person. And I like to think of myself as a forgiving person as well. And there's, I think there's a distinct difference between uh, Howard Letterer and Chris Ferguson in one sense. Well, actually in many senses in terms of responsibility. I know at the World Series, Chris Ferguson started coming back the last two years, has not spoken to the media, has not issued an apology, has not acknowledged, not acknowledged even in the least, how the site that he helped create and people trusted in him and his name and his brand put them in dire straits. A lot of people had their entire bankroll stuck there for years. Um, someone asked him at the table during the World Series, you know, are you ever gonna apologize? And he gave them a smug like, for what? And I just thought to myself, wow. So whether he was, you know, and Phil says, I think he's innocent. I'm like, okay, but he's, he may have been 
innocent in the sense that like he never knowingly tried to defraud players or you know take player money or anything like that but he's clearly guilty of a double middle finger to the poker world by coming back in and just waltzing in and saying i'm not doing a media i'm not apologizing i'm not doing anything and like what do you exactly expect but part of a big part of and i'm not at that place of um enlightenment where I can forgive people who don't ask for forgiveness. It's kind of imperative for me. For the person, if I'm gonna forgive them, they have to ask. Howard Letterer came to my house. We spoke about the past. He acknowledged openly to me, like his role in it, how he had gotten, you know, uh, his ego had grown. He sort of, um, you know, made they made a lot of mistakes. He wanted to write a letter to the poker role before he came to the World Series. You know, whether you accept it or not, it's irrelevant. I still think the steps that he took in order to sort of be welcomed, or not even welcome, just to come back in the poker room, at least he come, he said something. He also did some interviews that I ripped to shreds before called the Federer, the Federer, Federer Files uh, with Poker News. And I called, I did like a Federer Files rant, which you can find on my YouTube channel. It's a very long um, sort of breakdown of how I wasn't satisfied with the answers. But point being, he still was willing to speak. And I find the only way to describe the way in which Chris Ferguson is handling this is cowardly. It's cowardly. If you truly believe that it wasn't your fault, say so. If you truly believe that no, your actions in no way just, you know, hurt nobody, then say, you know, I'm not apologizing for anything. If you do, though, think that since you were the person, Chris Ferguson was the person who was vehement about specifically Ray Batar being at the helm, specifically Chris Ferguson, you would think you'd want to take some responsibility for that. Okay, if it wasn't Ray's fault, wasn't whose fault? I mean, it wasn't your fault, it wasn't Howard's fault, whose fault was it? You know what I mean? So I'm just a little bit shocked to just, I couldn't be that kind of person. Like if I did something really stupid or I screwed some people, like I'm not gonna run and hide under the covers. I'm gonna confront it. If I, if I made some mistakes, I'm gonna acknowledge it. I may ask for forgiveness. I'm gonna certainly take ownership of it. And uh, to see him kind of come back in and then a lot of people say, oh, you know, time is gone. I'm like, yeah, lots of time is gone and we still haven't heard a peep out of him. And he's not, you know, you know he's, not, he's not saying anything. So I just find like those types of people to be untrustworthy. I mean, I, I, I mean, what good excuse could he have? I mean, so I guess from his perspective is like, what good would it do, right? People are still going to not like you if they don't like you. I don't know that that's true necessarily. Um, I, for one, you know, was willing to hear out Howard and you know change my tune. Not change my tune in terms of what happened. It still was complete crap. But in terms of saying, okay, you know, this is a man who has, in my eyes, like somewhat humbled himself to say, listen, I made a mistake. I'm acknowledging it. Chris Ferguson has done no such thing. He's done this instead. Um, you know, people are asking, do I think he should have been eligible for player of the year or anything like this? And I, yes, absolutely. I don't think that um, either what Chris Ferguson, Howard Letter, or any of the people involved in Full Tilt did um, warrants them being banned from the World Series of Poker. The only one type of people that should be banned are people like Ross Hamilton, Monsieur Montlube, who actually cheated the game of poker. There are so many people in poker and, and out that have screwed people for money, left, right, and center. And um, it's not the World Series job to play like you know, police on that or like play nanny. It's like, he didn't cheat the game, the integrity of the game. He just disrespected it. And um, I think Phil Youth was short-sighted in one area just to post that picture and thinking like, hey, listen, you might like Chris. You always like Chris. You think it wasn't his fault. Uh, let's hear the story first and foremost. And let's hear the story from Chris Ferguson. Let's hear instead of, I have nothing to say to a reporter or when someone asks, you know, do you, are you ever going to apologize? Saying for what? You know for what? You know, you know good and well for what. People trusted you. Oh, one guy at the table said, you know, it's just so smug. One guy said, you know, my money was caught up there for years. He said, well, did you get your money? He's like, yeah, eventually poker stars bailed me out. He's like, so there, you got your money. Like, what, the, what kind of response is that? They didn't get their money because of you. You know, it wasn't you that had, any, had anything to do with that. You ran and hid back to Phoenix and were hiding under the covers while Full Tilt was up in flames and you were just like MIA, you know? So not, I would love to get to a place of being able to forgive someone, but as I said, part of that for me, and maybe this because I'm a flawed, flawed human, it requires um, them asking for forgiveness. Like I'm not gonna forgive somebody who doesn't actually ask for forgiveness. So I would still say that 
it would be the honorable thing to do. Whether it makes a difference for any human being out there, for Chris Ferguson to speak publicly about whether or not he has any sorrow for, for the players and what happened or anything along those lines. I think it would be a, a good time for him with winning the player of the year to speak publicly about it. I, it might be too late, probably is too late, but I still think, even in this case, better too late than never. Um, so on that note, guys, that's the end of the Full Contact Poker Podcast. Um, I'm not really like on any sort of schedule with things right now. I'm, like I said, I'm going to continue to work and grind. My schedule looks like I'll be playing the Bellagio WPT. I may enter some of the high rollers if I feel ready to test out my new poker brain, see how that goes. But I will be in Bahamas for the high roller there. Super excited for that. I'm also going to, well, you know, they've got the million dollar one drop is coming back. World Series of Poker just announced that. Uh, oh, speaking of announcements, on Twitter, I couldn't believe this, but Bill Perkins was trying to start a petition with like Lauren Roberts says I'm in, Dan Shack, a whole bunch of the quote unquote recreational players saying they will not play in a high roller that doesn't contain a shot clock. Because apparently the one in Europe, World Series Poker Europe, did not have a shot clock, which creates a miserable experience for pros and amateurs alike. So when you have the pros hammering for a shot clock, when you have the amateurs hammering for a shot clock, when you have every organization doing it, I think it's time for the World Series of Poker to step up to the plate and, you know, they're last in line in this area and they need to um, put forth a shot clock. Because again, and now I'm starting to understand, honestly, with what all the learning I'm doing with sort of this journey to GTL, I'm understanding now why these guys tank for three, four minutes sometimes. Because some of it, like, you know, there's some of it is like some pretty complicated math that they're doing. And like for me, I'm like, shit, I hope I don't become one of those guys <laughs> while I do this because it takes a little bit of time. So a guy like, for example, you know, Christoph Vogel saying, you ask him, he's like, him playing in a shot clock tournament, he's not as good as he would be in a tournament that has no shot clock because he's notoriously slow. But what he's doing is very complicated mathematical um, breakdowns of situations and given three, four minutes, he gets to the right answer a lot more often. The problem is if everyone were to do that over every decision and you're playing eight hands an hour, you're going to destroy the game as uh, on Twitter. It all started with Stefan um, Sonheimer, the goose, who's been doing really well. He specifically said, we need a shot clock. The, the recreational players, the Germans are calling for a shot clock. The recreationals are calling for a shot clock. I don't know anyone in the high rollers that isn't. So it's time World Series of Poker, I think, to go ahead and do that. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about World Series-wise is the million-dollar one-drop. It's a lot of money to buy into a tournament for. I will not be putting a million dollars into that tournament. But um, I – and I don't know how to do this. I really don't. I'm like on my podcast, I'm going to sell pieces. What? Like all these guys have – you know, I don't, I don't ever sell pieces for tournaments. Like when I play the Super High Roller Bowl, that's all me. Uh, all the 100Ks, I put it up 100% of the time. I'm not putting up a million. I'm willing to put anywhere in the neighborhood of three hundred to 500000 depending how – the next six months go um, in terms of like my results in tournaments. The better I do, the bigger the piece I'll take. So I'm not going to sell it a markup. I feel like, uh, well, I mean, I feel like I, sh I probably should and could in terms of me being a you know better in the field because that's usually a much softer field than your typical high roller. Having said that, I, I'm not selling pieces because I want to make a profit. I'm selling pieces because I want to lower my variance and I think a million dollars is too much to put in a tournament for me. So. I'm probably going to end up putting three and five hundred thousand. Now I just got to find people who want to buy pieces at face. So if you're one of those people that just want to put up the whole chunk, <laughs> you can get at me at. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. You just reach out to me. I'm sure I'll know you. If it's not some random guy, just give me seven hundred k. Um, but yeah, lots of uh, exciting things coming on the horizon. I will be continuing to go to the Golden Knights games and rooting them on, um, eating like a pig, doing my shortcut to size doing my poker grind, taking care of my pups. Little Rocky and Paul, if you heard little Nexus is rattling, that was them running around here. I love these guys, they're so adorable. Um, but yeah, hope you guys enjoyed story time. I'll give you a wide spectrum of different stories, <laughs> I'd say. I've never told that story publicly, clearly, but I wanted to like do it justice. The first one, of course, is what I'm speaking of, and I think that we did. So without further ado, y'all, peace. Till the next one.